The Apollo 14 mission was NASA's third manned lunar landing, and while hurtling earthward through the abyss between two worlds, Dr. Mitchell experienced a life-altering epiphany when he was engulfed by a profound sense of universal connectedness. He intuitively sensed that his presence, that of his fellow astronauts, and that of the pla planet in his cabin window were all part of a deliberate universal process and that the glittering cosmos itself was in some way conscious. The picture I took shortly after we landed. But what is so powerful, that's interesting, that's what the surface looks like. And that's the sun reflecting through the high gain antenna coming up in the east. Uh, the, and blossoming in the, the lens of the camera. But the, this picture, is the one that let's think about for a moment and look at this beautiful planet that we're on. Let's remember, I want to start with this, that back in 1957, when Sputnik was first launched, astronomer Fred Hoyle, in knowing that space was uh, going to be our next frontier, pointed out that if we ever got a picture of Earth from space, life would never be the same again. And it turned out to be true. The picture you just saw, plus the others that we've taken since 1968 on Apollo 8, are the most published pictures in the history of the world. Since 1968, the first ones were taken. There hasn't been a day in the major cities of the world in either the print media or the electronic media, but what one of these pictures has been featured on in the electronic the broadcast day or on the, the, the news media or print media. And one asked the question, why? Because it speaks to us at a very, very deep level and asks the question that all generations have asked since the beginning of times. Who are we? How do we get here? Where are we going? What is it really all about? And uh, Lynn, in introducing me, uh, did describe what happened to me in space. And as it turns out, it happened in some sense to all of us that uh, all of us that were in space, particularly those of us who, particularly those of us who were in the lunar module position, lunar module pilot position, which is my position, which I'm getting a little ahead of my story, but it's because she had made this introduction and we look at that picture that I will tell this story a little out of sequence. And most of the men who flew as lunar module pilots and our job was to be the expert in the lunar craft itself. And the expert and knowledgeable in all facets of the lunar exploration. Our other partner, Circle and Kep, was an expert in the command module, and our boss, Alan Shepard, was our boss in this case. He was an overall commander, but the, the two of us were the experts in that particular realm. And our job to make sure that uh, everything was carried out and carried out properly. So when we started home, most of our job, job was, had been done, except to be systems engineer on a well-functioning spacecraft. And so we got to look out the window and uh, gaze a little bit at these pictures, as you saw. And what happened was that, well, we were in a position of flying pointed vertical to our flight path. We were in the plane of the Earth, the moon, the ecliptic, of the Earth, the moon, the sun, but flying perpendicular and rotating to keep the thermal balance on the spacecraft. And what caused that cause to happen was rotating once every two minutes. It caused the panorama of the Earth, the moon, the sun, the heavens, to orbit through here and move through the window every two minutes. Wow. <laughs> it really knocked your socks off. <laughs> and uh, so all of us that 
had that experience, particularly lunar module pilots that uh, had a little chance to be tourists and talk at the window uh, on the way home, all had this powerful type experience. Now I'll talk to that a little bit more, a little later in the lecture and talk. <clears throat> but let's go back to the beginning and, and, and start that uh, little nice story. <clears throat> I grew up here in the West. I grew up in the state right south of New Mexico, born in Texas, grew up in New Mexico. <clears throat> and uh, in the Depression, I'm 74 years old now. And uh, <clears throat> didn't really plan, I didn't have any great plans on uh, being an astronaut or even being a pilot, although I started flying when I was 13 years of age. I didn't, uh, I was really going to head for business. And it turns out the Korean War came along about the time I graduated from high school. I mean, uh, yeah, from high school. I got through college and then it was my turn to go. And I uh, enlisted, enlisted in the Navy and became a pilot and went off to the Korean War. But I was still serving my, serv my duty uh, with the Navy in 1957 when Sputnik was launched in October of 1957. And I realized humans would be right behind the robot spacecraft. And that sounded like a pretty interesting thing. So I was already bound for test pilot duty. I went back to MIT, got a PhD, and that set me on the course to be selected to in the Apollo program in 1966. And uh, then to <clears throat> get the chance to go to the moon as uh, that tended to evolve. Now one of the reasons for that is that <clears throat> we each got a chance to choose our technical specialty uh, when we were asked to come into the Apollo program. And I chose in my, my technical specialty the lunar module. And so that meant that I got assigned to with Fred Hayes, I'm going to go on 13. With 15, with 15, with 15, with 15. And Fred Hayes, who was the leader of the Apollo on Apollo 13, I'll tell you that story. Apollo 13, he and I were assigned, I was a senior officer, and he and I worked together, flying back and forth between Grubb and Bethpage, being the astronaut representatives during the final stages of design and testing of the first lunar module. It was our job to get the first ones ready to go, ship to the cave, be the astronaut office representative in that process. And so the first lunar module was Apollo 9. That was the first test in lunar orbit. So we hope to get that done. Then I went to back up on Apollo 10, which was a rehearsal for the lunar landing as lunar launch Apollo. And Fred went to Apollo 11, which was as backup, which was the, the first lunar landing. What that meant was that in due course, what we would probably should, in the normal rotation of things, uh, get a prime crew flight three flights later. And that would be Apollo 13 for me, Apollo 14 for him. And that's the way it worked out. Except I was serving with Gordon Cooper on Apollo 10 as backup crew. And he retired from the program, and Alan Shepard, the first man in space, uh, who had been grounded a number of years because of the inner ear for problem, uh, lobbied to come back on the uh, program and be flight, be in flight status again. And he went to Apollo 13 to replace Gordon Cooper. Except headquarters said, Alan, you haven't been training in a number of years, so maybe. You and Jim love a lot of switch missions, and you, t you and Mitch and uh, Bruce would take Apollo 14, and then Jim Love would take 13. Well, we weren't particularly interested or happy about that at that time, but as it turned out, you remember the story. They got the bad machine, and we got a good machine, and uh, uh, we got the land, and they had to come back. Well, the interesting part is, you see, my buddy Kim. Uh, Fred Hayes was on Apollo 13, and Ken Mattingly, the third one of our trio, we were kind of a trio, and, uh, like to be together. 
Ken Mattingly, if you remember the Apollo 13 story, was the command module pilot on Apollo 13. And he got bumped because he got, uh, at the last minute, because he had been exposed to the measles of Charlie Duke's kids, <laughs> who was Apollo 16. Uh, so Ken got bumped. He never got the measles, by the way. And he was ticked off. And uh, we were a little bit ticked off, but nevertheless, we did our duty. And then Apollo 13 had their explosion two days out. I happened to be in mission control when it happened. Ken was all sulking because he was still ticked off about the whole thing. He was immediately called to go to the command module simulator and started working on the problem of how do we get him back. I immediately went to the lunar module simulator from mission control. Uh, and he was working in the command module simulator. I was working right next door in the lunar module simulator for four days. He was working on, if you remember the movie, how do you get them back in with virtually no power left in the command module. Uh, the batteries were just barely margin, marginally enough to fall. And, and I was uh, in the lunar module simulator trying to figure out how do you use the lunar module as a tugboat and the lifeboat to get home. And how do you fly it manually in case it loses? That's a problem. Do it all time. So we spent four days in the simulator. He was in the Apollo 13 movie, I was on the cutting room floor. <laughs> and Ron Howard and Tom Hanks made profuse apologies to me at the introduction of Apollo 13. The, the, before we, they would let me see it, they had to apologize first because they do it from the cutting room floor. <laughs> Anyhow, so that was, that's the story of Apollo 13. Apollo 14. The, mission of Apollo 14, a mission. We went to where Apollo 13 would have gone, from our region of the moon. And if you look at a full moon, uh, and divide it in quadrants, vertically and horizontally, and look just to the left and down a hair from the center of the moon, is the from our region. region. And uh, all, of the, all of the flights uh, became a little bit more daring. Apollo, Apollo 10 was a rehearsal for the lunar landing, but did not land. Apollo 11 was the first landing. They landed and uh, grabbed a couple of samples, jumped back to the spacecraft, and came home. All they had to do was, was show us that it could be done and get, and get back home safely. Apollo 12 was to execute a precise landing at a precise location, do a little bit more work around the spacecraft. Apollo 14. Uh, took Apollo 13's mission, and we were the first to do it in a real science, so to go beyond just getting there, grabbing a sample off the surface, and getting home. And our mission was to do a geology trek two kilometers from the spacecraft up, up a crater, a uh, cone crater, it was called, a thousand foot across crater, 750 foot deep and uh, do some real geology and some real science on the moon. And uh, we had a little pull cart, like a golf cart, uh, and if, to help remember that, it was, I remember Alan Shepard hit, hit, hit the uh, first golf ball on the moon. And uh, <coughs> when I got done, there was an experiment called the um, uh, solar wind experiment, I collected solar particles. And it had a, uh, had a uh, staff that was used to hold the wind machine up, like a wind machine. I used that as a chaplain, so we had the first lunar living. It's a chaplain of throwing a golf shot. <laughs> and I have to admit, you know, I have to brag. I have to brag. The, uh, my gentleman went out that much further than I was golf shot. <laughs> but they're both in the crater about 50 feet away from the spacecraft. It didn't go 